I mean, contribute to community in terms of blogs or maybe uh, as a session speaker or something like that, it will definitely add into your portfolio. So if you have any such uh, stuff in your mind going on, if you want to contribute, maybe you can reach out to me or anyone out there. It will be really helpful. And also we have been doing some live Twitch streams on like uh, the Twitch and LinkedIn on Thursdays, 3.30 p.m. Uh, so yeah, you can catch up live as well with your questions and all. Me and Alexandra Martinez, who has, who's also a developer advocate. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. With this, I hand over to Jeff and Alfredo. Harry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, <laughs> All right, um, as I said, I, I gave you a little bit about my background, but I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem since about 2006. Um, as you could probably guess by my accent, I'm, I'm not British. Um, but I came over here in about 2012. Um, I previously was the CTO for uh, the IBM Salesforce practice, uh, used to be called Blue Wolf. Um, and yes, as I was Referencing earlier, uh, I think MuleSoft really has changed my opinion of what is possible with integrations and changed our philosophies about how we deliver. Uh, I am a certified MuleSoft developer. Having said that, please don't ask me any questions. <laughs> um, I promise I will not touch any of our clients' MuleSoft uh, projects, but I am bought in and I love drawing up your G architecture. Um, with that, the actual expert in the room, or one of the experts in the room. Yeah. Hi guys, that's my face. Eduardo here. I work at Third Eye. I've been here for the last year and a bit. Uh, in my past life, I've been involved with a lot of integration projects, data migration projects. I used a lot of different tools, but it's only since 2006 which I've been working a lot with Salesforce. I've been doing a lot of integrations with Salesforce. I like to say I work with Salesforce on the outside, never really touch the platform. Um, and during that time, I got myself a Salesforce certification, which, much like Jeff, don't ask me to do anything with Salesforce. Um, I uh, started my Newsoft journey in 2018, although I wasn't really doing any client work with Newsoft. It's only because it was acquired, and I kept hearing people that it was a great thing. So I started looking into it, started styling, playing with it. Uh, but it's only over the course of the last year at Third Eye where I got a lot of project experience, a lot of knowledge from all my colleagues who are mentors, who are trainers, which allowed me to become a mentor and a certified architect. Um, and over the course of this time, I experimented with other things, emerging specifications like Coda and GraphQL. Anybody knows any of those two things? Show of hands. GraphQL or Odata? Not very many. So I will be talking about this one later in detail or that, that. So brace yourselves. We'll be talking about uh, another specification. And least, last but not least, I am a massive Pokemon fan. Oh. Anybody in the room who likes Pokemon? We can have a chat later. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that's me. All right. So a little bit of context into what you guys are going to see today. So, as you may have noticed looking around the office, we like plants. And our plants represent um, our employees, our plants represent our partners, our plants represent our customers. So literally, um, <laughs> admittedly to the five people who just said they joined third, I mean, haven't done this yet. But um, the traditional thing is for the first day of work, you go and pick out a plant. First time a client comes to the office, you go and pick out a plant. Because the concept of the plants is they are beautiful things that bring life and energy, but they need your attention and constant commitment, right? So our plants are really significant to us. And our old office, uh, previous to this one, was out in Deptford. Uh, we are Southeast London uh, loyalists. And we had a ton of plants in that office, and we were a fairly small company at the time. And then COVID hit. And uh, obviously COVID was bad for, for a lot of businesses, it was bad for us. Um, and there was that period of uncertainty. We didn't know how long this was gonna last. And we had shut our office in, I don't remember the exact date, but mid-March. And we came back into the office uh, 
in April. Um, I had been watering the plants in the office for a while. We came into the office and our landlords had been in the office and the heat had activated and it didn't turn off. And the office got super, super hot because it had been a weird sunny day in that April. And, uh, and our plants had all wilted. And I walked in with my co-founder, Kelly, who is my business partner, well, my life partner. Um, and we saw all of our plants just wilting and dying. And uh, especially in the context of the scariness that was 2020, we said, we, we can't let these plants die. Um, having said that, I also suck at taking care of plants. So we said, what can we do? We, you know, we've got the best experts in a lot of different technologies here. How can we make sure that we keep these plants alive? And so that born uh, Project Vita. And so Project Vita was all about how do we keep remote control of, or remote monitoring of things that are really important to us and how do we raise those alerts and what can we do to bring this in with all the technologies that we have at our disposal. So this was the uh, real genesis of what became our innovation programs. For those of you that don't know, um, because the technologies we work in change all the time, Third Eye uh, only has a four day client. So we work for clients four days a week. One day a week is dedicated to learning and innovation because to stay the best in the market, that's really what it takes. Um, so that's a commitment we have made and that is what raised Project Vita uh, along with a lot of others. So the solution that we came up with, the original intent of the solution was to work with what Salesforce used to call IoT Cloud. Um, part of the reason we do these is to find out practical applications. Turns out uh, that particular product uh, was killed pretty shortly after we started the project. So we had to turn to other products that we knew well, which were MuleSoft, and had to find other alternatives to the IoT architecture. And that is what we did. So with that, we leveraged all the different products. You can see here, Heinz Analytics, Field Service, and Create the Use Cases. And Eduardo will talk you through the more technical details. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I actually have that up. <laughs> Thanks, so, many, so. so um, let's look at what we've been doing with IoT and sustainability. So agenda for what I'm going to be covering now. We're going to be looking at two parts of our project. It's much bigger, there's a lot more than that, but we're only going to be looking at two things which we call IoT orchestration and data virtualization. We will look at the solution architecture of those two, then a little demo, and then we will do a technical deep dive in your data protocol and how your soft supports it. Again, some consideration and some time for QA. Okay? Feel free to stop me throughout if there is a very pressing question, otherwise we've got time at the end. So let's set the scene a little bit. So following everything that Jeff said, some of you must have met April, I don't know if April is still in the room, she's at the back. So April is our mom, I mean our office manager. She looks after 50 plus Salesforce and Microsoft consultants. Not only that, she also looks after some 40 plus plants which are all around the office. So all of these people and all of these plants have a lot of different needs and it's really hard for, for April to look after every single one of us and to know what we need. So luckily for her, we've got a lot of know-how in this practice and some of our people that know about Salesforce and Microsoft came together to try and use those technologies to help her to help her specifically with consuming some IoT device readings. So these plants, some of these plants will have some sensors in them that constantly send readings to some of the platform we will look at in, uh, briefly. And off the back of those readings, then automatically create some notifications for April to see and act upon. So that's one thing. The other thing is to have a centralized place. Imagine it's like a it's a centralized monitor from which April can have a look and see the outcome of her action. Okay, so I water a plant, what's happened? Is now the humidity for the soil in the right range or is it not? So this is what we did for her to help her. 
Um, so let's let's have a look at what are the systems that we used for this solution. So it's two systems. On the left hand side, we've got Thingsboard. Thingsboard it's an open source platform. Um, imagine it's a massive database for uh, large amounts of data where a lot of sensors keep sending readings on a constant stream. So imagine every second, every two seconds, every five seconds, depending on how, however you set it, all that data goes into things for. So that's one thing. On the right hand side, we have Salesforce. Salesforce is the place where we want to manage your cases. So that's the place that we tell April that something needs attention. And it's also the place where we have a, the product catalog for all the plants. So that's the place that tells you every specific plant, what kind of care they need, how much water do they need, how much fertility the soil requires, how much light does a specific plant need. So all of that information is reference data that sits in the product catalog in Salesforce. So Things Board needs to access the reference data that is in Salesforce to know how to take care of a plant. And it needs to be able to instruct Salesforce that a case needs to be raised when something's wrong. On the other side, Salesforce needs to access the real-time readings that are in the things board. So what is the problem here? The problem is that we've got data that's locked in these connected systems. So as integration practitioners, what do we do? Anyone guesses? We integrate them. So how did we do that? So, um, we've implemented two different kind of patterns. On the left hand side, we've got the IoT orchestration one. So, on Google Pla Cloud Platform, we have, we have our ThingsPort instance, which is constantly listening for data that's coming from the plant. So, these plants constantly send events on a queue that exists somewhere on Google Cloud and it's listening for these event messages which are then consumed and going into this database. Then what it does, it's got an internal engine that creates some automation to look at the current readings and then check against the API that we built on Salesforce to access the product data. So it, could, it does a call out onto the API that goes into Salesforce through the Salesforce connector to learn what are the values for the care of that plant. Once it's got them, there's some comparisons, makes sure that everything is fine. If everything is fine, then job done. If anything is outside the preferred range for, for that plant, then it sends a message over another API, which is the case API, that then creates a case on Salesforce. So once a case is created, April, our office mom, can look inside Salesforce, be notified that something needs to be taken care of, and then she can do it. So, nothing too interesting here. We all know these things, right? It's all very synchronous, it's all very clear. This is slightly more interesting. A little bit more, that's right. Um, so, this is what we call the centralized sensor monitoring in this case. So on this side, on the top we've got um, still April, that's looking inside Salesforce. She wants to know whether any of her actions put the plant in the best care possible. So she wants to know whether the humidity is right now. So how does she know that? That data is in, in, in Thingsboard. She will, con she will log into Salesforce and Salesforce is set up with Salesforce Connect. Salesforce Connect is a Salesforce product that is capable of consuming Anodata API. So just bear with me on that one. I will explain what Anodata is, but Anodata is basically, it's a way to standardize the way you consume a RESTful API. So basically, Salesforce only makes noise the URL of this API, and then it automatically knows how to consume all the data that's made available by that API without having to write a single line of code. And again, just trust me on this one, I will explain a little bit better later. By doing this, by putting this layer, this data layer, on top of this database, then April is capable of seeing real-time data that exists here, but it's never sent into Salesforce. 
So if any one of you has worked with Salesforce, you will understand why this is important. Salesforce is quite expensive when it comes to storage space. Imagine sending terabytes of data on a continuous stream onto Salesforce. First of all, there will be performance degradation. Secondly, you will have to pay for a lot of storage. So instead of that, Salesforce only wants to see the latest values that are the latest readings. And this architecture allows us to do just that. Next slide. So we look a little bit at how things are done. So first of all, in things board, there is what's called a flow engine. You all know and work with Microsoft, you know what a flow is. This is very similar, although it's different for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't look as pretty. Secondly, uh, it's got a if then else kind of structure, which we don't have in Microsoft. Sure, we've got the choice browser, but it's not quite the same thing. So, what is, it, what is interesting about this one? I, won't, I, won't go on, I will not go into detail, but what this is telling you is that when what's called a telemetry changes, a telemetry is a reading. So, a reading from a sensor changes, then if there's a call out to Salesforce to know what are the care values for that plan, there's some comparisons. If those comparisons say that everything is fine, there's nothing. If anything requires attention, then it goes through this path and it does another call out to Salesforce to create a case and then finishes. So that's all this does. Then we built the Salesforce system APIs. Nothing too interesting here. This is an API that allows you to do a bunch of things with the product object from Salesforce. It allows you to read data, to update data, delete data. Nothing interesting here. Stuff we work with every day. Um, this is a screenshot of a case that was created on Salesforce using that piece of integration. You can see here this was created by the integration user. And what this is telling us is that one of our plants requires watering. So if you read the details here, this is telling you that the moisture is currently 3%. Our plant is thirsty. And it tells you what the actual uh, ex um, optimal values should be. When April logs into Salesforce, she gets a notification, she looks at the case, she knows exactly what she needs to, to take care of that plant. So this is the, the first of the two um, so, um, integration pathways. Now we're going to be looking at the second one. So this is the data virtualization one, the one that's based on, on um, OLA. So look at this for example. Now this is a screen that is showing you the current readings of a device called Power Application Extension. So we also we have also all sorts of sensors, not only plant sensors, we have power sensors, air quality sensors, this one is for power. Okay? What this is telling you is that at the time we were looking at, these were the leading values for a bunch of measures that are related to current, like the effective power, the apparent power, etc. etc. Et Sorry, go back on the slide. So all of this data, if you are familiar with Salesforce, this looks exactly the same as any other object looks like in Salesforce. It looks like standard objects. What's interesting about this one is that all this data doesn't live in Salesforce. Salesforce only asks for it when it needs it, but because the API is built with the data, it can consume it automatically and render it as if it lived in Salesforce. So even though this data is coming from an API, nobody's actually written a single line of code to make it look so pretty on Salesforce. It's a lot of box. Right, so now we will have a little bit of a deeper look at what your data protocol is. So first we will start looking at the problem statement. So, um, Every one of us works with RESTful APIs. We all know that it's standardized. It allows you, it defines standard methods that pretty much do the same things. Although a lot of people, unfortunately, use methods the wrong way around, like to get some data, sometimes they use POST, or to write data, they use GET. And that is one of the problems with REST. So when you work with a RESTful API, it is up to the developer to define how things are designed and how things work. 
What that means is that there are varying, varying degrees in the ability to, for example, filter results. So whenever you work with a new API, you don't know whether you can filter. Maybe you can, maybe you cannot. And if you can filter, how can you filter? Can you filter on all fields? Only on some fields? Only on some conditions? You never know. You need to look at that specific API and learn how that API is built and use that specific way. Same for varying degree of ability in specific, specified fields. A lot of the APIs that we work with, you always get all or nothing. You can't say, I only want this set of fields. Sometimes you can. Again, it depends on how that API was built. And you get different ways to implement pagination. Is, is there pagination? If it's built, is it based on uh, pages, number of elements per pages? Or maybe do you work with limit and offset? And if it is limited offset, are they called limited offset? Or are they called top and skip? So again, it's, it's a lot of different things that are not standardized, and it means that we need to learn every single way as people who work with these APIs. Another obvious outcome of these problems is that you can't just plug in a RESTful API into a system and expect it to work. You have to build custom code to consume that API. So that's why OData came to be. OData stands for Open Data Protocol. It is a protocol that defines a standard way to query RESTful APIs. So it piggybacks on REST. So it still uses REST, it still uses the same methods, get, post, delete, and so on and so forth. But the way you query an OData API is standardized. It means it's always the same. It means it implements pagination always the same way. It implements sorting always the same, sorry. Not implements, defines. Defines those things the same way. So whoever starts working with a RESTful API that uses the OData protocol, they will always know how to get only some fields, how to sort, how to do pagination, because they're always the same. It defines standardized data types. Again, if you always work with the same data types, then it's easy to, um, to predict how things work and to automate their consumption and URI conventions. What's important is that this is a protocol. It's not an implementation. It tells you, it's like an interface. It only tells you how you can ask for things and what you will get. But it does not tell you in any ways how you implement that. How you implement that is entirely up to you. You can use anything, you can use Microsoft, you can use Java, you can use C++ if you want. Um, it's entirely up to you. I like to say, and a lot of people like to say, that it's like SQL but for recipients. So if you look at what a URL request for a, um, for, a, for an API that supports so data, this is what it looks like. And we can look at this, the different parts, for example. So this bit here, format JSON, is instructing that API that we want the response in JSON. This bit here, select the device ID, device name. This bit is telling us, only, I only want to do two fields. This bit here, ordered by name, is telling us that I want to order the results by this field. Top and skip tell us that oh, I only want three records, but skip the first three out of the ordered set. It will always look like this. So you can see how it is very similar to SQL. Um, one way, so the, all of these is actually based on a XML file which defines the data model for the objects that are exposed by your data protocol. So if you look at this, this XML, the interesting bits are, first of all, it's always at that link, metadata. So whenever you query, and, well, I should say forward slash metadata, whenever you query that endpoint, you get this information. And this is information can be consumed by any system, and that system will be able to automate the consumption of this API. So in the example we were making before, Salesforce, Salesforce all it does, it looks at this, and it automatically knows, okay, my that API is exposing two objects, one is called device and one is called latest entries, and then automatically knows how to consume it. So nobody went and wrote any kind of code to consume these things. Salesforce 
learned it when looking at this piece of XML. And if you look at the making bits, this is telling you there is one object called devices, and these are the fields that are in that object. And it defines the types and other things that can be used by a system to automate the consumption of this API. So now we will look at a bunch of things. First of all, um, MuleSoft supports uh, Orada. You need to install a plugin in any point studio. So any point studio 7.90 and above, you just add this plugin. Uh, go and look at the documentation to know how that's done. Um, recently, MuleSoft also released support for the V4 connector. So there are two major releases for Odata, V2 and V4. Obviously, V2 is older. Um, um, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the new soft support wasn't great in that instance, but I will show you how with the version 4, uh, they made a major leap forward and it's actually very cool and very easy to use. Um, there are some limitations and I will show you in a bit what those limitations look like and I now will jump into a little bit of a workflow. I will show you some things. Let me see. Okay. Bear with me, guys. So, first of all, I might show you how these things look like. First of all, in Salesforce. Um, actually, no, first of all, Postman. This is the bit when I start talking about. What is it? This monitor is up. Right. Ah, found it. Ah, uh, come on. Yeah. <coughs> okay. There you go. Okay, so um, this is the audit API that we built for this project. So I will show you a little bit of things so you can actually get a sense of what we're talking about. So this is that metadata um, endpoint. As you can see, when you query it, it responds with that XML that we were looking at before. So this is telling you, again, we've got the devices object, we've got these fields, we've got the latest telemetry object, we've got this field. And it also tells you that there is, here it's telling you there is a relationship between those entities. So that's another thing that the data protocol actually supports. It supports relationships. So you can query across relationships as well, which is quite interesting. Um, and let's have a, a little bit of a play with um, the things that you can query. So first of all, let's just do a query on devices. And this will return us the list of all the devices and all the fields that exist in that object. So nothing special about that. This is what any API would return you. But with the OData support, we can do things like adding a select statement. So here I'm saying select, only give me the ID, the name, and the type. So if we, if we ask for that, this is what we get. We get still the entire list of all the devices, but only those three fields. And you can combine all the clauses in any way you want, just like you would do with SQL. So if I wanted to say, for example, well, you know what, I only want this guy. Then you add a filter to say that the ID needs to be the same equals as this particular GUID, you send a request, and all you get is that one element. Or you can filter in a different way. You can say only give me stuff that um, has a name that, that is greater or equal than T, and that's all you return to. Um, other things you can do, you can order by name, and if you look at all these things, they're all ordered by name, air quality, blah, 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 again. So these are all standard. All you need to know, all you need to learn is how to ask for these things, and then you can basically use any data API, it will always give you the same behavior. And that's why it can be automated in its consumption by Salesforce. Okay? 
So these are the raw calls that you would do using the protocol. If we look at Salesforce, allow me to faff about again with the cursor for a moment. Let's go back to this. No, sorry. There you go. So this is what it. Uh, I need to log in. Sorry, guys. One sec. Allow me to log in. So this is our internal Salesforce org. I will not get to the one where we build all this fancy stuff. Log in on that. And then try that link again. So basically, what we've done in Salesforce, we've gone somewhere into the settings. And we told Salesforce using the product called Salesforce Connect, this is the link to my other API. Salesforce downloaded that XML file and it said, okay, I found these objects, which ones do you want? We said we want devices and telemetries. And it created what's called in Salesforce an XML object. And having done just that, nothing else, then you get all of this. You get to see all the data that it's on the, those devices. These are all the devices that we have installed. We've got plant sensors, we've got power centers, sensors. If I were to click onto this one, for example, we can look at its current readings. Now this is, this is a power sensor that's actually in our city host, city host house at the moment. So we're looking inside this house. Um, and we can see, these are the current readings, 15th of September, 650 this is basically now it says that this is on this is the power that was used yesterday and so on and so forth so all of this data doesn't exist in salesforce it's on those apis salesforce is capable of rendering it and also create relationships between them see we started from the uh, device and then the telemetry is for the device just because all of that it's taken care of by the protocol in salesforce we didn't write any code to tell, you, to tell you that. And that's how it's interesting. Now Salesforce, what it's doing under the hood is just creating requests that follow that format that I was showing you on Postman. So if, for example, I were to say, um, I don't know, let's go back to the devices. Uh, and I want to apply a filter. And I want to filter <coughs> for stuff that as a specific sensor type, for example. Uh, where is sensor type? Sensor type, and we only want motion. Then Salesforce <coughs> will create under the hood a request that says, only give me that stuff. And that's, that's all done for you. Um, unfortunately, Salesforce, sorry, uh, Microsoft, the, uh, the, the, the uh, data before connector doesn't implement everything of the data for. So look at the documentation. In the documentation, there will be a section that tells you that some things are not implemented. And one of those things, for example, is um, it doesn't support the stats with operators. So if I were to say um, label, Oh, no. I filter. I want label uh, starts with so this says Kishan I will start with KI so this should fail that didn't fail uh, maybe it uh, contains that is not supported
there you go. It was contained. So the contains clause is not supported. So this is this is what comes out. Uh, this is an error that's raised by the API. Okay. So just be careful. Most things are there. Some things are not there. It's all documented on the official documentation. Now, so that's what it looks like from the outside. That's what it looks like when you use it. But how do you implement it using Moonsoft? So let's have a look at that now. So we go into Studio. Faff about with my mouse a little more. There you go. So first of all, I will start with a. It's an empty project. This one. There is nothing under source. I've already done those bits that I mentioned before about installing the plugin. So that's that's already done. Um, I have put under the source main resources API folder the XML file that defines my objects. So this is the same we were looking at a moment ago. It defines the devices, the fields, the type of those fields, it defines the latest determinants and so on and so forth. Now, since we have this and since we installed um, the API kit or data before plugin, we can do a very similar thing that we can do with API Kit for RESTful APIs, and that's generating a scaffolding for your project. So, clicking, right clicking on here, there is under new something that you may have never seen. It's part of the plugin. Uh, it says generate a new or data form API. So, it, this will create for you an XML file which is very similar to the file that API Kit creates for you but you will see it's got a bright orange new component that you might have not seen before that's your data before version of API Kit router okay? so what this does, when a request comes in it passes the URL, the method and everything else and then it forwards that request to one of any other flows depending on what flow they are. Now, you can you still have the get method just like any other RESTful APIs, get, post, delete, patch, blah blah blah, so on and so forth. What's missing here is the meet, it's the logic. So that bit you need to implement. Now, I have implemented using the data bit version, which is the previous version, uh, another data API that consumes a RESTful API and implementing all the logic that takes care of all those bits and bobs, does the filtering, does the sorting, does the select, it's very, very painful. It's really painful. Uh, but if you're lucky enough to be working with a database and all you want to do, which is what we did, is create a data layer on top of a database, since Orata and SQL are really, really similar, what you can do, and that's what Mulsoft did, they created some components that using that URL, parses it, and then creates an SQL statement using that. And then you can take that SQL statement, feed it to a database connector, and get the output. So, so long as you are exposing something that is a like-for-like -like on what's on a database, there is not a lot of build that you have to do. And in fact, let me show you what the code for that API we were looking at a moment ago looks like in real life. That's it. There's not a lot there. So let me explain what this does. These you don't really need in most instances here. I'm just changing the name of the database because on the um, metadata we called it one thing, the database called it something slightly different, it's just a capitalization that's different so we just set it to a different name but most times you won't need this, all you need is to say okay when the request comes in and what this does, it creates for you a bunch of data structures those data structures contains the parsing of your URL it contains all the clauses and the values for those clauses you pass that to this component which is called transform to SQL select so all those data structures all of this stuff, entity type name, fields, type keys, blah, blah, blah. I didn't do any of this. It's already been created for you by the API kit for Rodata. It's created those data structures. You can fiddle with them if you need to, 
if you don't need to just leave them as, as us, that spits out for you an SQL statement that you just feed as it is to a database connection. See? No logic at all in there. And then the last thing it does, it takes the outcome of this database, the result set, and it serializes in a way that is expected by your data protocol. And that's it. Nothing more. What if it breaks? What if it breaks data? It breaks what? Like the query that data is your query, the query is not fetching the result or something. Uh, if there's zero results, it will just return an, an empty result set. Okay. Yeah? And you talk about connection failures? For connection failures, well, you would have to handle them internally, right? So this is left simple as. So the, what this will do, it will just bubble up the error as it is. Didn't implement any fancy logic. You can't, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Uh, but the outcome of not handling the, um, the result is this. <laughs> because I didn't handle it, so it's just returning the exact error message as it is, right? But you can handle it differently. Um, so that's that. Let me go back to my slides. I don't know whether there's any more. Slideshow. Right, so that was it, that was the technical bit. Um, so now a little bit of a summary. So what are the things that we have done with this project? So have, we have done some automation that allows you to compare live readings that come from sensors against some benchmark values that live in Salesforce and then raise cases when there is a need to take action. We also created a centralized space from which anybody can monitor real um, live data that is coming from sensors and that doesn't sit anywhere in that monitor, it's fetched in, in real time using the data protocol. To do that we use our own, our own in-house accelerators and assets and also all the good stuff that Microsoft makes available, all the connectors, so nothing too fancy there. And this enabled us to create a solution that, from a Salesforce perspective, is literally no code. In Salesforce, we, we've not written a single line of code. We've written some code in Ubisoft, very basic, but no code at all in Salesforce. And so, what are the future use cases and applications for all of these? I mean, we've been playing with it to save our plans, but you can see how this can be applied to monitoring of equipment in construction companies when you need to know whether uh, a structure is sound or it's falling apart or there's something to be concerned about. Uh, when you want to be monitoring biometrics in, in a hospital, in a medical setting, when you want to know whether your patient's heartbeat is fine and so on and so forth. Um, in a laboratory when you need to make sure that an environment is sterile and you need to control all of, all of its uh, environmental uh, settings. Air quality, air quality monitoring in factories very, very um, relevant now with COVID when you need to make sure that there's enough ventilation, that the um, carbon uh, levels are not too high. Uh, water quality for farms, for fish tanks, for households, for all these kind of things. So this is where we see this going. And I believe that that is the end of it. Um, are there any questions before we have a quick break? Yes, at the back. Yeah. Um, what, in terms of the data set that you're using, have you seen any performance degradation of the results that's grown? Um, so the degradation would be entirely down to the database. Mm -hmm. Now, this database is built for large sets of data, so things board is it expects a continuous influx of data. So it works quite well with large um, sets of data. But yes, do expect some degradation, but that degradation entirely depends on the power of the underlying database. Yeah, we used it in an airline and um, they had a complex object hierarchy. This was outdated too, right? Yeah. But 
Um, it works really well for the reasons that you said about storage requirements. They can have to pay Salesforce huge amounts of money. Yeah. But over the course of two years, slowly the data set is yeah. getting their database. Yeah. That the, even with indexing on the queries, the response time went from like a couple of seconds through to 30 seconds. So yeah. I think that's a key consideration people need to think about when, when they, because you can get really rapid results for the long Very time. Much. Very much. So the way I like to talk about all the data is that it's for small data sets. You can't choose. You can't expect to use your data to ask for a large amount of data. Um, with Odata v2, and especially if you don't, when you implement it, it's very important that you push the most of the processing onto the data source. And don't try and do this in root soft or in, in the integration layer. Because imagine you didn't do the filtering at source. You have to take, you have, with every request, you have to take the entire data set, which could be terabytes, and then do the filtering in root soft. That's crazy. Can't do that. So in every possible way, you have to try and push the execution of the logic onto the data source. And that's why it's convenient to do it with a database, because it's easy to actually translate that, that logic into a command that you can give the data source. When I said earlier that I tried to do this consuming a RESTful API, the reason why it was painful was exactly that. Because for, in order to do everything and anything, first you have to ask for everything using the normal endpoint, and then implement the logic using data with. Every request is so expensive that it doesn't really make it worth. And I think that actually goes kind of back to your point as well, even though your point was more about large data sets. Yeah, I mean, you weren't retrieving a large data set, it's just the, 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 the size of the URI. Right. Um, we weren't retrieving a large data set, though, it's just the volume of data that was backing in at that store, even the query execution time yeah. started yeah. to degrade over time. Yeah. And then you're looking at things, you're basically offloading the problem saying the integration has been led, the database needs to be highly performant, yeah. and then you're looking at indexes and caching of data sets to kind of keep that responsive. In this sense, it was the contact center where people were calling up and saying, why am I flying? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, precisely that. Thanks. Probably uh, the fair point Yeah, that Postgres sits on Google right. Cloud. So, so there is something like auto scaling as well, right? But yeah. Why is the infrastructure part of that? It's kind of way easier to do that, right? So it's, it's more like a uh, kind of uh, infrastructure now. Uh, yeah. yeah, but again, it depends. It's basically, it, it auto scaling, auto sizing might improve the integration. So yeah. Or yeah. Or the yeah. Or the like that. Auto scaling would. In any scenario on Google, I might think the scenario that we're on premise in the data center with a SQL cluster. So, like again, it's architects, we've got to consider all those dimensions when we're looking at the right side of this type of solution and how it fits. I think it's incredibly powerful, um, but it's about aligning it to the, to the use case and understanding it's not just one. What are the implications of the scenario? Sorry, I can't hear you. Can we pass the mic on? So, in this implementation, we can use sensors to be able to use the data on the other side. Yes, I noticed the need for every update sensor in the system. We do like to use the program, all the things to the part of the data and see the real data. Yeah. So, what logic would be implemented there to not check for each update which are coming from the I don't think I'll need a mic. Yeah, that's fine. He said it doesn't need This is the part of the... I forgot to give it to the previous ones, but then... Can you check if it's on? Oh, that's on. That's fine. This is on. Okay. Awesome.
Uh, my name is Ajay. I'm very happy to be here in person uh, for this meetup after the pandemic. This is the, I think the first time we're meeting in person. Uh, and uh, yeah, just a quick intro about myself. Uh, I've been with uh, Salesforce as a company for over five and a half years now. Uh, we'll go back to some of the background a little later, but I've been with MuleSoft as an ecosystem for over two and a half years. Uh, so currently in my capacity, I lead uh, the team of free sales engineers for MuleSoft here in the UK, I practice. I started off with financial services as an uh, industry focus for me, but I've taken over other industries such as media, telecom, high tech, HLS, healthcare life sciences, manufacturing, and retail as well. So we have a, a very strong team of about 40 pre-sales engineers and architects uh, supporting UKI as a market. So in my role, uh, we try to figure out what customers' challenges are and help them identify the right solution for them and work with amazing partners such as yourselves in the room uh, to actually bring you into the implementation mix. So a little more background if I rewind before Salesforce, I had this opportunity to work on this uh, amazing startup with my college buddies. Uh, and I was there for about three years, uh, building uh, the products, doing multiple things, uh, third employee in the company. Yeah, some of you might have heard of them, uh, called Hacker Rank. So uh, I was one of the earliest employees. I sort of set up the company from a scale up, and my last stint at Hacker Rank was selling the solution license to Salesforce. So we raised up to Series B, Series C, and uh, LinkedIn was just about to buy us. I would have probably retired early, uh, <laughs> and uh, that didn't happen after Microsoft picked up LinkedIn, so they dropped the ball on us. And I walked out of the company with my shares still active with me. And before HackerRank, I was at uh, Microsoft for a greater part of the decade, uh, doing multiple things. I'm a product engineer by profession, so I started off in the SQL business, uh, building out SQL Server. So SQL 2008, SQL 2012, SQL 2014, uh, shipped those products as product manager, engineer, architect, and that's when it hit me. Uh, I don't love to sit at a desk and work. I need to be out there talking to customers, and I switched to an advisory role. And Azure was starting up in Microsoft as a practice. Satya had just taken over from Steve Ammar, uh, and I actually set up the Azure practice for India back then. And uh, yeah, so that has uh, been my journey so far. And uh, just connecting to the last session, which was very interesting, and I'm going to try to keep up with this very innovative session that you just saw. Anybody in the room can tell me what is the relationship, because you heard Eduardo speaking about OData and SQL are very similar. Or, you know, he spoke about them in the same context. Can you tell me, like, why is it that way? Or what is the origination of OData? Who created OData? Who was created? Go for it. I can't remember. It was either a group of correction of vendors, but it was Microsoft leading it. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I was interning at Microsoft when OData was actually being drawn on a paper map can. And the person who created OData today works for Salesforce. Uh, so, his name is Anil Nori. You'll find him speaking at Greenforce about our data platform product. So, he's been hired to join the CDP uh, team. So, OData, interesting innovation, but then, as uh, uh, said, moved into more of a, an open source community, started getting more standardized, and a lot of companies adopted since, and you'll see amazing innovations that I have adopted. Uh, being made out of it. So Salesforce has immensely benefited from the adoption of OData and so have our customers as well. So without further ado, what I'll try to bring today to the table mix is I wanted to share some of our product roadmaps and the vision that we are having. Because one interesting thing that we keep hearing from our customers is we are not transparent enough about how we actually are building some of our products and what are we going to do in the next three to six months to a year's time. And I've been a huge proponent of being able to share some of these messages transparently. Uh, I used to do so when I was on the Salesforce side, uh, leading commerce and marketing cloud practice. And uh, this is uh, the first time I'm actually getting this opportunity to share this in a public forum uh, in uh, the Mulesoft meetup. Thanks.
Yeah. Okay. Right. So, firstly, forward-looking statement. You've probably seen this uh, before. The reason why I bring this up is uh, whatever you're about to see, and again, the summary of this is please make your buying decisions based on what we are about to offer today and not what we say we will actually give out in the roadmap. So this has an interesting story, which I will be able to share later, like what is forward-looking statement, what is the origination of it, and uh, it, it's got Salesforce touch to it. So we'll, we'll come back to this later. So firstly, since we already passed the forward-looking statement, wanted to share what's really happened with the product roadmap. So every year, our company collects a lot of ideas from developers, architects, and evangelists such as yourselves in the community, and they ask you to post it on a public forum. And this goes on to the Mulesoft Ideas portal. And here our customers, partners, and architects, developers, they actually bombard a set of things that they, should, they feel that should have worked, or it's missing in the product, or it's a big gap, <coughs> or which will make their lives easier. So this year, uh, I mean the last year, what happened was we got about 368 ideas of which they received 1,200 plus votes. And out of those, 45 ideas were actually picked up and implemented in the product so far. So uh, I'll be able to share what those specific 45 or you know, 368 were, but uh, I'm not going to present it on the screen. I can send it to you later. We have a filtered list which we are happy to share. And 18 of those ideas are still on the roadmap uh, and they have been filtered down to be implemented in the next one or two releases. And the ideas that got released to the public, or which is GA as of today, is about 34. So if you see this number, right, new ideas added and reviewed to the ideas of the roadmap, it's about 5% of the ideas that are out there in the public forum that gets published or community on the community forum actually goes to the roadmap. So as a company, and I spoke with our uh, chief product officer last week, and uh, I asked him, why is this only 5%? Because I was trying to prepare for this session. And I asked him, I get challenged. Why is this only 5%? Why not 20%? Why not 15%? So we are trying to increase the productivity of the platform because you've seen Yolsoft as an API-led approach only for all these years. For the first time, we sort of going away from not just talking about API-led, but also talking about the other capabilities that we are introducing. And that's what I wanted to sort of bring to the mix of the table today. And before we get there, I wanted to really give you a highlight of what we delivered this quarter. Because this is an important quarter, Q3, uh, which is the third quarter of the year for us in terms of our release. And you might have already seen some of this coming to you. So we'll speak about this more in detail. But if you're already using some of them, like Partner Manager, we really have enriched the ability to actually see end-to-end -end visibility of everything that you do with your Partner Manager, which was earlier a big gap. And what this means is you'll now be able to actually go deep into your analytics to go into the final levels of logging, which was not uh, available in the previous releases. So this is again come back to us as a feedback and hence they actually got it prioritized. So typically for your EDI, B2B kind of use cases, this was very critical, so it's out there now. The biggest shift that we have done uh, in our managed iPaaS is with the launch of Cloud Hub 2.0. So with Cloud Hub 2.0, you actually see us talking about a lot more scalability, being more agile in terms of our runtime and better manageability in terms of configuration itself. So things that we used to sell before, like dedicated load balancers, uh, as an add-on skew that we had to push our customers that, okay, you bought Mules out any point platform, but please also take these two additional dedicated load balancers. We don't have to do that anymore. So customers are going to save that delta revenue money because what we've done is the Cloud Up 2.0 comes pre-packaged with a DLB or set of DLBs. And we are going to advance that a little further to also take off some of the requirements around having a VPC and VPN, which also had to be purchased additionally. Now that is also going to come in as a part of the roadmap, I'll talk about it. But what this means is we are making this more granular in terms of the runtime. Uh, and 
where this is heading will be an interesting thing to see because uh, you all know that today auto scaling as a functionality in MuleSoft is only available to an ELA customer. You don't get to naturally see auto scale by default. And this is our approach in heading in that direction, uh, making Cloud Up 2.0, being able to go in that direction of being able to get into the auto scale mode, but it's not there yet, but it is on our own. RTF on OpenShift was a big ask because a lot of our customers were also in that OpenShift kind of an environment and being able to support runtime fabric in an OpenShift was a critical ask. So we experimented this for a while. We tried, I think, piloting this since 2021, last one year, one year or, or late 2020. And then uh, since that piloting gave us a lot of feedback, this actually went GA and now we have been able to actually deploy customers in their OpenShift containers. And the last one is the most critical one because with this we are actually moving away from being just an API-led platform to more of an automation plus integration platform. So I'll talk about the automation package when we get there, but with the automation launch, what we have done is we've launched a bundle together and this is an interesting concept because we acquired a company called Service Trace headquartered out of Germany, a very small company, about 30 to 45 employees, and uh, that was fully bought into the company, and then we actually rewrote a lot of the platforming, and we have now fully embedded that into the automation package. So the automation bundle that you'll see us talking about in, at Dreamforce, and I'll share some of that detail today, consists of three important factors. It consists of things like robotic process automation as a key element, Composer, which you have already seen uh, us talking about, and then an endpoint platform as well. So the endpoint platform that goes into an automation bundle will not give you the a minimum to be core production capacity. It will come with a 0.5 core capacity, hence we are calling it as a, a miniature endpoint platform, which would probably be required to set up like, let's say, two or three APIs, because when we are looking at automation as a package, we want customers to be able to build automation using RPA, and then take those assets and put, publish it to Exchange, and if they need more complex integrations, then start using any point platform to uh, you know, bring it together. And then we also can give the customer an early start. Uh, I'm happy to talk about commercials later, like what that any point platform bundle looks like, because I know that's probably something uh, you would probably get a lot of questions around with your customers. So with that, we'll move further. So the three key items I wanted to cover today is around what are we doing in the robotic process automation space, uh, and then marinate that with Composer. Composer has been there as an experiment, initially what started off, uh, and then we've been adding a lot of connectors to the Composer ecosystem. And then I want to talk about what we've done with any one management platform and with the integration platform itself. So last, uh, a few months ago, you, uh, you saw us launching the Universal API Management, which is our Flex Gateway offering. And with that, we're sort of offering now a more fine-grained capability for customers who don't really need complex integrations. Maybe they are building integrations elsewhere, but need a layer of governance or just a, an overarching proxy layer. And that could be a, a quick and easy way to actually see how MuleSoft ecosystem comes into the mix. And the last one I want to talk about is the platform itself, which is primarily around some of the security updates that we have done. Before we actually proceed any further, the, one of the reasons, uh, uh, so I'm not, how many of you attended Connect here? This year? So I attended the virtual. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay. So this was, uh, this was an interesting event because uh, while we actually spoke about automation, we actually didn't get to showcase the product at full scale. And that is probably one of the uh, big gaps that we have in feedback that we should have focused a lot more, we should have heard a lot more from the community. And that's where I think there's going to be, I, won't, I don't know if they're going to do like a connect relaunch, but they're going to do another large automation meetup. I wouldn't call it as a meetup, but a gathering here in London because we actually have a good developer ecosystem here. So this is again coming from what the product team wants to drive as an initiative. And before we get there, a couple of things that we actually did with this automation bundle is 
uh, well, let's start with Composer. So Composer already had some of the things that are going into some standard connectors. So what we have launched very recently is the HTTPS connector inside Composer. So basically with that, it basically gives you the ability to go and connect to the external ecosystem, which Composer had a limitation on. And Composer is a, a quick and easier way for a Salesforce administrator to connect to an external world. Uh, and one of the biggest advantages of having Composer in the ecosystem is it is built on the same metadata platform as Salesforce is. So behind the hood, it is actually running a Mule runtime engine which is hosted inside the Salesforce. Sorry, sorry. sorry, I just wanted to check. So does that mean if we give it a RAM, we'll give it an OAS spec, it can now speak to any API that's described by That's correct, OAS. that's okay. correct, yeah. Nice. And uh, because a lot of business users often got to a point where they asked us like, what about Composer connecting to third party systems? How do we talk to an external REST API? And we had to figure out a way to make it more non tech focused but give them an easier way and the roadmap you'll actually see us launching a lot more connectors down the line so the larger vision for the company <coughs> around composer is and i don't know how far this will get stretched but all the any point platform exchange connectors that you see there we will make this declarative on composer so somebody who is not a developer should be able to use all these connectors 200 plus connectors available on exchange inside of the Salesforce CRM ecosystem, and still be able to do whatever they uh, are trying to do with their connectivity. So the other things that we have launched is the templates to connect. So similar to the Microsoft templates, we've now launched Composer templates. It's very early days. Uh, we are trying to build more industry-focused use cases around it, like financial services, there could be an onboarding template, customer onboarding. For uh, service cloud journeys, there could be a call center automation uh, template. And that is where we are hearing from customers and feedback of what is that they want that makes their life easier. Task metering is basically the monitoring which was missing in Composer, which basically tells like what is the task currently doing and where is it actually going. If it is hung, if it is not processing, if it, there is a delay in processing something that was not previously visible, uh, they had to go and look at some of the detailed logs or ask Salesforce support to fetch those logs for them. Now we've made it much easier and, uh, and clear for somebody who's working on the composer. The other ones you're probably well aware, like we actually are trying to bring in more mapping and flow similar functionality. So if you've used Salesforce flows before, or process builder, which was like the older generation one, we are trying to bring all the flow capabilities inside composer in terms of mapping so that if a Salesforce administrator is very acquainted with this flow, he should be able to use Composer. So they shouldn't have to think of reskilling themselves or learning something new because we want to make it like platform agnostic. With providing process automation, we are launching the marketplace assets. So what that means is uh, when somebody creates an automation bot with a set of flows using RPA Builder, they should be able to publish that as a reusable asset. And that's a big element because when you actually publish it as a reusable asset, it becomes a component that can be used across your integration use cases as well. And the whole idea is we should have a single library to be able to publish it and to use it across the system. So we'll speak about what that automation uh, template looks like and uh, what that means for our customers community. The IDP connectors are really the document processing connectors and we, these are the ones that can really go into the documents, start scraping out the data, look at images, start uh, looking at what kind of text is embedded in the images and bring that data back into the bot cycle. So think of this as a use case. Like today, uh, when you're working with a bank like HSBC, uh, compare that with a bank like Monzo. These two banks have very different customer experiences when you're trying to sign up with them for the first time. Monzo makes it very easier for you to, from the time you start your journey to apply to getting a bank account versus HSBC as a different journey path. What, what they do really well, and this is I'll tell you the Monzo story a little later, Monzo really tried to slow down their onboarding process because 
the speed at which the customer could really get a bank account was scary for them. And a lot of customers said, is this all that you need to get me a bank account? Are you sure that you have everything that you need? So they basically introduced a few delay pauses and additional steps from the first time they launched to the version 2 and version 3. You actually see them delaying some part of it. Uh, HSBC, they will ask you for a lot of your documents, uh, which they, maybe the branch manager will ask you to send over email, your uh, residence proof, etc., etc. So all that detail, once it comes to the map, they actually download it, send it to a team, which actually looks at it, and they have a form where they actually manually type it in. So it takes about one or two physical days to actually somebody to transfer that data. What could happen in a customer onboarding journey like that is, you could see that data, the moment it is sent in an email, being scraped off, you could insert it into the form directly, or it could go into an integration flow that is ready to accept the JSON format or an XML format of that data, and without any human intervention. So basically, at the end of the day, we are also in a place saying that we are cutting down somebody's job, but we are also automating a lot of human tasks. So that person could actually put, be put to a more productive task rather than manual filing. So RK async flows are the other one coming up, and enterprise ready identity access management is coming up early next year. So what this means is we don't have currently ability to be able to save your enterprise grade IDP ready, uh, IDM ready in uh, RK space, and with that we'll be able to also integrate with any third party identity access management like Okta and uh, others in the market. So this was like the high level. I'm happy to take questions whenever you have any doubts or queries, because we have a, a lot of content. I sort of thought to prepare at a very high level, but then we thought we'll share the public roadmap in a much more detailed sense. And you'll get a copy of this as well. Yes, we will. So with Composer, uh, you're already having these connectors available. So there's a connector to uh, RPA Bot, Marketing Cloud, HubSpot, Microsoft, Business Centrals, Box, etc. The ones that are coming up are going into the BigQuery, Snowflake, Sage, and we are also launching the version two of HTTP connector. So the reason you will see us investing a lot more in the Composer space is early 2018 when Microsoft was almost integrating or was getting acquired or completing the in, uh, acquisition process, uh, our CEO, uh, co-CEO, back then was uh, Chief Product Officer, Brett Taylor, who is now co-CEO, talked about the citizen developer experience. So what does the citizen developer experience really mean? Somebody who has never written a single line of code can actually effectively do everything that they need to do to manage their business automation by dragging and dropping stuff more a declarative way. And we give them the whole power of the acquisition platform, which is MuleSoft, which is one of, not the whole entire power of the platform, but the connectivity aspect, which is all the connectors, ready-made templates, and out-of-the-box assets, reusable APIs. And those are the ones that you will see coming down this list. So maybe the next time we speak in about six months or maybe three months, you'll see a few more connectors getting added. So what was like a one product manager working on this connector space is now doubled down to about 12 product managers. So each one has a mandate to release and launch about 10 connectors in a couple of months. So you can actually see the scale at which we are going. And this will all go into a place where there will be a universal marketplace for all connectors. So customers could even come and look at our connectors it could be paid connectors. All of this today, being launched in Composer, are free connectors. Unlike uh, in MuleSoft at any point, you have some paid connectors like for SAP, etc. So we are not yet investing in that direction, but Composer connectors are all out of the box and free of cost. So with respect to the HTTP connector, uh, this is the one uh, that actually changed the game for Composer real quick. Because until we spoke about HTTP connector, Composer was seen as like a, an adopted child. Like nobody wanted to, okay, Composer, let's keep it at an arm's length. It will disrupt uh, our conversation if you are positioning any point platform. And maybe it's a very, very tactical use case tool. We don't want to bring it in the mix. Today there are customers who are working with us 
for buying both Composer as well as AnyPoint platform because they realized having the value of both of them in the same company, this can be targeted at a different audience and AnyPoint platform can be targeted at a more technical developer audience. So what we've done in the uh, Composer space is we've supported all the elements. The last one was around pagination. So that was the key one because without that, we couldn't actually talk to customers about scale. So Salesforce customers today work across millions of records. Some start with thousands of records, but go up to the million. So pagination actually gives us that ability to scale and ability to also do uh, support all the methods that HTTP call would do. That's something that we have introduced. And with connection authorization requests being up to date with the industry standards, those are the ones that is available to you now. The ones that are coming up and the upcoming release is the next release for Composer will actually support all the XML data types, which is not fully supported. So if somebody is using the HTTPS connector, uh, or HTTP connector they will actually have some challenges if they try to explore the XML data types. So again, in spirit of transparency, this is something that we are working to fully support all the XML data types. And that's coming up in the next release. Before I go into RK, just want to pause to check if there are any questions. Yeah. Hi. Um, let me use this. Sure. Hello. Never mind. Um, yeah, so I have a question. So, um, you know, we um, Microsoft also have another product called Flow Designer, mm -hmm. which is kind of like I don't know how do you see where to position in in the entire Microsoft product collection. You mean the browser based? Flow yeah, design. the the flow designer because it's also meant to be easy to use and quick and integration. Right. But right. And um, you, there's, there's no official statement about it yet, but you didn't hear this from me. We are actually kicking it. So it's feel. it's of no use <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and we actually got some stats of how many customers actually use that today. Uh, and we've spoken with, uh, I think, some of the customers who actually use it today based on like, their status of what we've been able to hear from them. So the thing that we've heard around Flow Designer is customers use it typically for, let's say, a product manager uses it to prototype something, and that's it. They probably just use it as a, a, a rough ideation mechanism, and nobody really uses it for what it was built for. And if you look at Flow Designer, we have not invested a lot of our engineering resources internally. So all these innovative connecting features or the enhancements that we are launching with connectors, they have not directly trickled down into the Flow Designer themselves. And Flow Designer had issues with respect to how it could handle buffering and you know the moment you could see that the flow becomes really complex, the testing, the, it actually got into a lot of performance issues. So. Really, we haven't invested any resources to re-engineer Flow Designer. So what you'll typically see us doing is Flow Designer will continue to stay there as one of those elements, but soon will be phased out with something that we launch. And I don't have exact details of what that will be replaced with, but you've already seen some prototyping of it, what we're doing with Composer, uh, what we are launching with uh, our next generation ID. We'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, those will be some interesting elements to see and watch out for. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this is probably a very philosophical question. Go for it. Um, so, I understand what Composer is for. It's to enable citizen developers to do their own thing. Um, but how does that, how does that reconcile with the whole API-led connectivity shebang where you've got all of that side managed by a team that if you've done it right, they know how to implement API-led and how to go through the different layers, right. blah, 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 not to implement spaghetti kind of connection. Whereas if you, if you give Composer to anyone, then you will probably have a proliferation of point-to-point -point integration. Yeah. So how, how do you reconcile the two things? Yeah, no, this is good. This is a, a very valid question coming out of what could go wrong in the hands of somebody using Composer in a, uh, a way that is, leads to building a lot of point point code. So we asked this same question when we actually were piloting this with a few customers. This was last year. 
Composer was not yet fully, fully launched. And I think the idea today is uh, while Composer actually in the behind the scenes uses a mural runtime, uh, you'll actually see us bringing in a lot more governance to Composer down the line. And what that governance would do is it would enforce the sense of anything that you build in Composer is like a straightforward flow, right? And the whole result of doing that is that flow should, in itself, should be treated as a reusable asset, which it is not today. So you're able to save that as a template, you're able to save that as a flow, but the idea behind there goes back to our API-like philosophy that the flows that you would build in Composer will be able to map back to, how should I say it? Uh, you've seen Visualizer, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to visualize the Composer flows you know, depending on where they sit. So they could all be system-led uh, composition of flows that you build to do those tasks there. But that's where we are working towards how do we bring back Composer into an API net. Because for an administrator, let's say a Salesforce administrator, they can keep creating numerous composable tasks. They, do, they may not have control, like 100 tasks, 1,000 tasks. And we don't want that to add to a lot of technical debt in the organization because they might not be able to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. So we will bring governance on that. Yeah. So that's that's our first step in that direction. Okay, so, so now the problem is there, so you're working on a, on a way to, uh, to prevent. Yeah, and we are trying to address this at our selling cycle itself. So when when I and my team go into a selling motion and we hear customers telling us that, oh, I want to just bring data from another Salesforce org and put it into a, a Snowflake database and maybe do some processing there, and then I want to send parts of it to NetSuite and part of it to another database, and maybe some notification going on to Slack. So if they tell us this, we try to identify who is the, who is the problem solver here, who is the problem buyer, who is trying to adopt this technology. If they're telling us that, look, we don't have a developer, a proper, proper developer, we are a small company, we are an advertising agency, for example, let's yeah. say, and they tell us we outsource developers, yeah. uh, and this is the problem we have. How can you help? Composer is the way to go. The moment it goes a little more complex, if you're talking to a media company, they have an in-house IT team, and if they come to us with this exact same problem statement, we'll never position Composer yeah. here, and we should never do as well. I get you, but at the same time, you're kind of saying, if today you're small, we let you build technical For tactical, for tactical use cases, yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. because in Composer, I've seen the opportunity landing as low as 6,000 USD, right. 5,000 USD, right. and there are customers where, let's say we wanted to win that logo, we've just given it away for free, right. because we want them to use for a year, see what you make out of it, and come back to us next year. And it's one of those ways where we start creating stickiness with the Salesforce ecosystem. No, not to interrupt you. Yeah. You could have helped me, I was just keeping it up. Yeah. So, so, but I've interrupted you. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's a really interesting problem space. Right? Yes. And I've struggled with it. But the reality is, is there's a market, and there's money attached to that market, and so you need to meet the market need. But we've seen this with certain threat enablement, right? And the idea was stop beating people up with a governance stick yeah. and, and try to enable people to do better. And so one thing I'm thinking about from a product perspective is how could you potentially be using AI, right? Because Composer's going to be running in the cloud. You're going to have all the data and the insights. Could you not be saying, hang on, Mr. X or Mrs. X or Ms. Right. X or whatever? You're, you haven't gone to Exchange, you haven't looked at it, but you're building a flow that looks really similar to some flow that's already in, registered in Exchange. Why don't you go and use it or why don't you go and check it out? Right. So are you doing that? And if not, then I have 10% of revenue <laughs> when you implement it. Yeah, so because because Composer sits on the metadata platform itself, uh, one of the biggest advantages that we'll be having available at, to our disposal is to use the Einstein ecosystem. And Einstein today has no role to play in the news of integration landscape. Uh, and Composer, because it exposes those objects to Salesforce, uh, you, we've seen some customers customizing the results of what Composer does as an object inside an Einstein prediction engine to tell them what is the frequency at which somebody builds these kind of composer flows. But we haven't put anything on our roadmap. I saw a similar idea being posted on, uh, 
our ideas portal, asking what are you doing in the AI space? Uh, are you doing anything at all? Because it is really required, as you said, because I wouldn't necessarily remember what I had built two years ago. Maybe somebody should be intelligent enough, the system, to tell me, hey, look, you had already built something similar. Why don't you reuse it? So yeah, it's, it's been there on our roadmap. And I saw some upports, but I don't know if it's been picked up. Yes. Is this being built as a lead service, like as a pay as you go? Because you're talking about smaller you know, industries or smaller companies. Uh, because one of the things that uh, I, I work for a smaller firm, sure. it's almost like you know, it's the it's newspaper and print. Right? And they're trying to do some sort of work for RPA and mm -hmm. solutions. And what they found was Microsoft doesn't offer a solution that will sort of meet a pay as you go. And so I was asked to explore the solutions that I can mm -hmm. of, surprisingly found quite a few. Right. And uh, I was wondering if there was any consideration being put into retail services. Very, very valid. So uh, I'll, I'll address that question right now, but we'll probably also talk about the pricing later. Okay. So the automation bundle that I spoke of, uh, come and it's not there on the slides. Huh? So automation bundle comes with any point RPA, Composer, and uh, the miniature version of any, any point platform itself. And we give what is called as automation credits when somebody buys that. Mm -hmm. So I think the retail price or the list price is 57,000 USD for this bundle. And a customer would get 57,000 automation minutes or automation credits. Or credits. So the way we differentiate ourselves from the market uh, compared to, let's say, a robotic process automation vendor like UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, our automation credits actually are treated like your mobile data. If you don't use it, it still is there for you to use it until the end of the period, but we've gone one step ahead and given customers a three-year rolling period for those automation credits. So you actually pay for what you use, and if you don't use your automation uh, bought for, let's say, a certain amount of time, you get back that credit. So if your bot completes, let's say, a task very quickly, less than a calculated time, and the, it, we have certain calculation that we are happy to share. So let's say it completes its automation task in less than 30 seconds, because the metering actually starts post the 30 second mark. Mm -hmm. And if it completes within the 30 second, the credit goes back to your pool. You're not even charged for a task that completes within 30 seconds. So, we are actually making customers look in this direction of pay as you go. If they eat up all their automation credits, they buy more, and this is our approach. And in February next year, that's something that you'll hear at Dreamforce, we will be experimenting uh, pay as you go for any point platform as well, which is now available for universal API management. You have uh, you know, pay as you go or usage based pricing available for your flex gateway it is being increasingly challenging for us to move away from how we used to base price at a core level and finally we've heard after many years customers telling us why are you not doing usage based pricing why do i have to pay for cores up front right so you'll actually see this coming for the whole integration suite as well which will probably be a game changer because some of our larger customers who actually buy in millions of dollars of package from us, we often see that they either don't use the credit at all or they overuse it and we never know. So the overages are actually sitting parked somewhere. So this will help us in a way. It's a win-win for both customers as well as the company. Uh, more announcements on that at Dreamforce because I, can, I have only limited details of how that structure would look like, but I'm happy to catch up maybe post Dreamforce because we'll have more clarity and uh, I'm happy to share. Because that's what I do, my team does on day to day. We go in front of customers in the sales cycle, we make it clear for them why is that you need to buy this platform versus not this package of the platform. So that's a good conversation. And does RPA has a triangle store? Good question. We are currently not open for trial with this, but if customer is actually doing uh, evaluation with us, we do like a, how should I say, a boxed, sandboxed environment that we open it up for them. 
And because this incurs an infrastructure cost for us, um, which is very different to the endpoint platform cost, um, we don't have an open trial yet. But you'll actually see this going in the same direction where today you can sign up for an endpoint platform for 30 days free access, right? So that should naturally come in that direction. But as of today, if you want, or your customers want uh, RPA, automation access, they usually come to us, get into a deal cycle, only when we see that, okay, this is a good fit, we have done discovery, we open up our sandbox to them. And will be partners? I think we have, we are already opening up partner sandboxes. Yeah, because uh, if you sign up for our training, I think the hands-on training, in the lab they give you a sandbox, and I think that will open up for 30 days. So that's so one of the... I think that doesn't have the 57,000 credits. Yeah, and it's a particular figure that's Yeah, I think less than 5,000. As I've seen, a couple of thousand, but not the total scale. Any other questions before we move on? So this is the RPA bed, which is, uh, we lost three key elements which are available to you today, RPA manager, builder, and recorder. And the one interesting thing that uh, we're actually coming up with is the ability to push those assets into exchange, because today bots can be created, but they are not reusable. And this is coming up very soon, so let me say H2. This is almost the September release, or the end of October release. So on-demand bots are going to be very interesting, because so far, you've seen the Salesforce ecosystem. If you've actually been in that ecosystem, you know that we can automate anything inside of a Salesforce ecosystem. We could do service cloud voice bots or chat bots or uh, a flow uh, that could automate a lot of things. But this is probably the first time that we are able to say that we can help customers automate things outside of the ecosystem of Salesforce. So what, with that, we're going to be launching cloud-based bot templates and bot specifications, or packages I must say, which could be very, very specific. So for example, if somebody needs to bring data from a third party system, automate it, uh, do some humane uh, tasks which are being manually processed now, put it in a bot, and get it to service cloud, we could now do that without customer having to think of creating an integration package for it. So you'll actually see us coming up with a list of use cases where it's a good mapping for a customer to actually work on an integration API design versus where they can actually get away with a bot design. Because it could so happen that customers who actually want to build a very lightweight integration, just, just a, does some basic processing, need not actually build a full scale integration. So that hence the automation bundle includes the any point platform as well. And I spoke to you about the identity access management, which is coming up. But what is already available today is the RPA connector flow flow integration. So if you are already using Salesforce flows, you'll also be already be able to see an RPA bot connector inside Salesforce flows, which is very powerful because that takes your Salesforce connectivity to the external world in a very, very different way. And we've had some very interesting use cases working with a media company where they get creatives from their ad agencies and within an image is a text as well, like there could be names and things like that within an image, banner, file, etc. So if they had to scan the text present inside the image is what the content matching was. Because sometimes the use case that we heard was very interesting that the file gets rejected, the posters of the content of that media file, JPEG or PNG gets rejected because the content that they would have said, some caption or some very key element, they would have given something but by the time it comes back from production, it is completely different. It's a mismatch. And by the time they review this, there's a lot of manual review, the content is already late to get to the market. And maybe if they're competing with a, a vendor, then the competitor has already got a leak because your process is delayed because somebody screwed up on the manual data engine. So with this uh, ability to bring in RPA connector into the flow integration, we've now been able to scrape that image data and tell if it's a valid flow to be continued or not, and hence proceed like if there's an opportunity cycle that needs to be closed, <coughs> progress. So th that was an interesting use case that I'm actually recently working on. Just last week, we got a, a media company that came to us with this use case, and they're already a no-soft customer, 
they tried to do this using any one platform. They said this was going to be overly complex just to use any one platform. What else do you have? So we did a POC with them. Two days POC, we were able to demonstrate this as a use case, and uh, they really like it. So let's see where this goes. Uh, this is one thing that uh, you've probably not heard because have you anybody has worked on industry clouds, healthcare cloud or health cloud, media cloud, financial services cloud? Awesome. So. Uh, very recently, about a year, two years ago, year and a half, two years ago, Salesforce acquired this company called Velocity, which was uh, a company that was very well known to build industry vertical specialization packages that gets deployed on the same metadata platform. So it was basically another app package manager that gets installed on Salesforce. And the person who actually formed the earlier team of uh, Velocity was a person named David Schmeier. So if you know uh, who David Schmeier is, so David Schmeier is the same person who also created Seabell and sold it to Oracle. Mark Benioff, uh, our CEO, has always been trying to acquire David Schmeier as a person, as a talent into the company since that Seabell story. right? And he was not able to because he sold it to Oracle for a very large amount, and he's been there happily. Uh, and then David Schmeier moved out, joined hands with a couple of very smart folks to form a, a, a packaging company called Velocity. So Velocity has been building all these industry clouds. They were on our app exchange for a very long time. And I think two Dreamforces ago, or two, three Dreamforces ago, they announced that at, at the Dreamforce booth, uh, Velocity was demonstrating the product. The story, this is the story. Mark Benioff usually takes a tour on the Dreamforce playground, campground. So he actually went and said, I want to acquire you. What do you guys think? And David Schmeier was there. And that was the, probably the conversation started where Velocity came. So Velocity has now been fully embedded into Salesforce, now called Salesforce Industries. You no longer hear the term Velocity. So for every industry, we have a cloud. So Salesforce says, uh, are you talking to a uh, utilities industry, we have a utilities cloud. Uh, maybe, uh, and very recently you heard us launching the net zero cloud. And I saw the earlier demo of sustainability. So what you have, guys have built uh, here at Third Eye could give a competition to a sustainability cloud, or net zero cloud of uh, Salesforce. So with every industry cloud, because each industry will have a different requirement, the energy and utilities uh, cloud, for example, we're working with, uh, um, you know, the, the British water company. And they actually have a lot of challenge, not just around metering, but also around the connectivity itself, but also the whole manual automation, that manual processes that they need to automate. So they've already been on our energy and utility slot for a while now, but they were not able to utilize the full benefit of Bluesoft. And what we have done is we've launched package managers that expose any Mulesoft API built on any point platform into the industry cloud. So this basically overrides the ability for you to have to define another system API or, or unlocking the data of what that industry cloud exposes. The data model is already exposed. So basically we are telling you, this is a pre-built system API, just go ahead and use it. You don't even have to put any effort. And there is a bunch of those specifically to uh, address those use cases. So. What this basically does is lowers the cost of onboarding and implementation. So the time it takes for somebody to actually come on board an industry cloud is now reduced. Uh, before we proceed further, and this is the part where we talk about productivity, I want to check if there are any questions. Another 10 minutes or so. Right. So we're doing quite a bit in this space, and I'll keep this at a very high level because uh, you'll get all of this and some of this is already out there uh, for you in the GA. So I'll talk about what is coming up, like this is the most interesting one, the code builder. How many of you heard of any point code builder? So uh, any point code builder is our approach of shifting away from the Eclipse based ID for the very first time. Numerous developers have told us around the globe that 
why are you still using Eclipse? Why is it such a pain to actually use Eclipse and it's so performance driven? I, it is so challenging for me to keep up with it. So we heard of everybody and any point code builder is going to be a plugin using the open source VS code. So if you are a Visual Studio Lite developer or if you have VS code which is open source, you don't even have to pay anything. Uh, we are going to launch a VS Code plugin. So you already have seen a Salesforce plugin for VS Code. So it's going to come very close to it. What that gives you a full capability is to be able to do everything that you are able to do on your studio now inside a web browser. So basically, ID from anywhere. So you could take your ID from your iPad or you could, you could think of a positive. Right? So this is going in public beta very soon and uh, we are showcasing a demo of this at Dreamforce uh, and we are welcoming customers to try out the piloting of this uh, before we actually launch it. Two quick questions on the When you say everything, do you mean everything? <laughs> and you, uh, can only... you work offline? Yes. So the offline capability is definitely a yes. When we go GA, you'll have, that's what I've been told, you'll have 70% of the capabilities of ID. Okay. Yeah. And which is, which is very significant. So just on that point, like a lot of the stuff that we do today relies on Maven. Maven it will be fully supported and executable within a browser environment. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the magic question. And what we have done is packaged it in such a way that that dependency when you are doing it in a browser-based uh, setup, uh, some of the pre-configurations are very quick, going to be very quick. You don't have to go through the whole challenge of setting up, up and configuring it. So we are going to make it as an installable package that is probably not going to take more than a minute or so. So the ones because I, we already have customers piloting this right now, and the feedback that we've heard is, <coughs> why didn't we do this sooner? Mm -hmm. So that's the feedback that we are hearing. Like it would have saved us hundreds of developer hours just to get this off the ground. You know, why didn't you do this sooner? So this is good. It is coming up. So private beta is available now. So if any of you in the room is interested, please reach out to me. I'm happy to put you through. Like I think we are accepting the private beta, but you'll only get it probably in post reinforce because we started accepting it a few months ago, and those customers have already got it. So we can still sign you up for the beta. We're running from an iPad, or we can So when you are going into the browser, like having different connections and getting used, that code should be preserved somewhere. Right. So th those are those are the exact topic of details that we are taking in terms of saying what are those minimum system requirements. So. Uh, can I go to the browser? Yeah. So, has anybody here seen the uh, uh, beta dot MuleSoft documents portal? Has anybody seen it? Because every time we launch a, a MuleSoft product and it goes into beta mode, there's all already a public document available and Code Builder because we actually launched the public uh, beta version, that is available uh, as a, a URL, which you can all access today to see what it looks like and read all about it. Uh, this is again uh, an Easter egg, which never gets published outside. So There was, there was some kind of beta plugin, right? That was released. Yeah, so that, that, was, uh, that was us prototyping and listening to what customers really want. And we've really built on top of it.
find the right URL, something that we can share with our customers. So. Sorry, I had to type in the whole URL. So, you'll get this URL from me, don't worry about it. So, we have actually launched this publicly in terms of a beta document to show what this ID looks like in the public. So, you'll see what this means in terms of configuration, etc., etc., user guide, how do you manage, known issues. And all of this is web driven. So we've heard some of the feedback and the other feedbacks like offline mode, those are really being uh, implemented. I think there's some level of offline work that you can actually do, but I think some of the uh, detailed work around logging or the ability to do unit testing, those are really missing from the earlier versions of the beta launch, which we'll include in the full GA, which is uh, coming up in the bottom of time. If I go back, I'll, I'll delete this URL. What do I switch this file? Okay, of course. So that was around development. We we basically moved on from development to talk about what are we doing in the innovation space. So GraphQL actually got federation as an update very recently. Yeah. Obviously, don't uh, like, guys. Please seriously, don't hang me for this one. The GraphQL stuff, right? So there's a, there was a blog post somewhere that did comment. Okay. One of the biggest challenges. A bit like the old data space. Mm. You're aggregating lots of different APIs. Mm. There's no guarantee that they will have the same pagination model, the same security model. Mm. So what are we doing? And at any point data graph when it first launched was quite limited in the security okay. models and they all have to be the same. Right. So has that been it's still the same. It's still, it's still the same. same. Yeah. Because that's the thing, it's like I can be you know it's five just APIs, been, just it's, still been the the it's still the same. Yeah. Okay. That that challenge still exists with us. And uh, I think that's the area that you'll probably see not happening in H2, but maybe H1. Okay, I yeah. uh, With respect to data works, uh, this is an interesting one uh, because we will be actually upgrading the data loader tool that you've been using in your Salesforce ecosystem. And for those who didn't know, data loader is actually using Mule runtime all this while behind the scene, all the way from when Mule was an open source. Uh, entity, uh, the data loader was crafted up to use a mule runtime because it was so scalable, it gives that kind of a volume ability to migrate data so easily for Salesforce uh, forms. And we are upgrading this, so this would give you a lot more buffering capability, a lot more. Uh, so today you know that Salesforce has a governor limit that it applies the moment it hits a particular threshold, right? So data loader, we are trying to change some of that so that it actually doesn't reach those limits. And with any point partner manager, I already spoke about it, uh, we're launching new accelerators, uh, manufacturing life sciences, and then consumer goods and financial services for wealth access management. Uh, last year uh, was the first year where we launched the accelerator for financial services world. Uh, I created that accelerator myself, and now we've actually added CDP as a capability into the accelerator. So 
for those in the wealth and asset management space or insurance space, uh, you can reach out back to me. Mm -hmm. I have uh, handcrafted some of those accelerators on that one. Uh, connectivity, we are now <coughs> going to launch some of the access into Azure Event Hub and Key Vault because a lot of customers that we found are also equally invested in Azure ecosystem. So that's one of the reasons where we didn't have uh, easier access to get into Azure. I will skip this because there's a public blog. I just bought this into the partner manager what we have done in respect to this. Endpoint data graph, uh, we've added new capabilities around what is coming up with respect to the data graph use, deployment options that's model what Cloud Hub 2.0 does, and federation is basically the biggest ask that was pending on data graphs around being able to create super graphs in minutes from the subclass. And this is the one that you can actually start doing and the version that is available right now allows CLI support and some of the best practices around the rule set. Uh, so there's still a team that is working on the issues that you highlighted in terms of improving the performance and also increasingly changing on how can we actually modify or work around the mutations. If somebody links those APIs and the data is modified, how can you ensure that there's data consistency? So there's some, still some work going on in that, but we are hearing what market is actually asking us, and that's where the data graph is. Uh, accelerators, uh, we talked about it, but you'll actually see us launching a lot more accelerators. Uh, it was very interesting to see the sustainability accelerator, which uh, the third eye team has built. I think we would love to have it in our marketplace, uh, and I'd love to see that come through. Uh, this was the last one, which just shipped yesterday. So the CDP accelerator for Millsoft basically unlocks CDP and brings it into the context. And we launched a lot of connectors uh, into the marketplace as well, exchange. So I spoke of the Azure Keyword and Azure Event Hub. And we also are launching the Siebel IP21 connector, which has been a long pending loss for those customers using Siebel. Because they had to previously use the old Siebel connector and then write their own code on top of that to manage to connect to IP21. So uh, for those who work in the Siebel space, uh, they'll understand the value of this. Uh, the other ones are already available, so you don't really see uh, big announcements being made in that. Universal API management is where I want to spend the next couple of minutes. Anybody used Universal API management today? Or seen a uh, functionality of this? So this was one of our big launches earlier this year for customers who actually told us that, hey look, I'm building all my integration on Azure, on AWS, but I need a better gateway to manage. So this is one of our ways to compete with the likes of Kong, Apigee in that space, because we've never reinvented our API manager for a very long time. It's been the same that was there since the early 2015, 16, 13, 14. So with this, we actually are able to launch like a, a flex gateway and a flex gateway on cloud. So this flex gateway could be deployed anywhere. And this is the flex gateway that we give you now, manage I pass. And this is the one that has a transaction-based pricing attached to it. So if you have any customers who need more of a gateway for governance and security, and just that, they don't need to be creating integrations, this will be the easier fit because all it gives you is the easier path to governance. Have you seen the uh, any point uh, exchange in a public format, like a partner experience portals, developer portals being created? Community, Community manager, which was based out of, yeah. So what's the difference? experience of a community manager, what does it mean for community manager customers? Yeah. Because I still don't know a good answer for you. So yeah. I'm hoping you're going to change my mind. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, I might not have the full answer. We'll have a path of, I wouldn't say path of migration, but we'll actually have a path for customers to get off the ACM. Because ACM, uh, community manager, had a dependency for somebody to actually know even community cloud as a dependency. And with Experience Hub, we are bringing the experience or the ability to customize developer portals within the AnyPoint platform itself. And does it mean that we are packaging in community manager within the ecosystem? Not fully revealed yet. It could be that 
the community manager experience which had all the drag and drop declarative experiences, you still get it, but customers need not have to know community cloud, for example. We are working in that direction. So this is going to be in beta for November, public beta available for customers to sign up. Even if you are experienced working with customers who are trying to design developer portals, I think I strongly recommend sign up for a beta, see how it goes, because uh, creating something like a developer portal can be a mundane task when you're setting it up. So that, that's not going to be based on experience cloud then, it's a different... We are launching this as within the AnyPoint ecosystem itself. Yeah. With the ACM today had a strong dependency that you had to go and configure community yeah. cloud manager and then you you know connect your wheels of AnyPoint platform. Which you can do by yourself. Correct, yeah. correct. And this would take away that initial setup and troubleshooting time. So Experience Hub will look like it is packaged. And what that package consists of is not something that we are sharing today, but you'll actually be able to do everything that you were able to do on a developer portal in any part of the platform. So the biggest driver for one of my customers on the community cloud was <clears throat> they wanted to federate out um, uh, the communities across their organization, so they're largely surprised, but they also need to control the onboarding flows. I see, okay. And so where does, where does kind of custom client management custom client onboarding fit between community manager and experience of right. is, uh, is it the same? Is it just as much custom development? We are hearing it will give almost the same experience. Like I understand what you're saying by onboarding, right? Like they need to go into it. Even custom approval workflows Correct. configuration. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that's something that we don't want to disrupt entirely for customers who are already on ACM. So I think we'll seamlessly get that customers onto this because I think this has more governance that we'll be able to establish within the AnyPoint platform ecosystem. So that is the first thing. And uh, we didn't want the customers to go through the pain point of setting up community cloud and troubleshooting if something goes wrong and having that extra skill set of community cloud development as an engineer as well. So you'll see, and that's where we're like welcoming customers to sign up or sign up for the beta. Uh, the last one is really around how, what are we doing in the security space. So uh, you saw me talking about Cloud Hub 2.0, uh, the runtime uh, in the uh, open shell. What's coming up is these interesting elements around distributed tracing. Yeah. So are you adopting open telemetry or open tracing? We are adopting open judgment. Woo! <laughs> Not even the basic term dies tonight. <laughs> so this has been a long pending task. Those who have worked with us uh, and the ecosystem know. And with that, it should really take us to the next level of capturing data and ability to trace that back to wherever you want to. And also giving as that capability into the logging of Flex Gateway and monitoring because this Flex Gateway could be deployed anywhere on any public cloud infrastructure and we really want to empower that as well. And under the management, we basically want to give a lot more reusability and how does that reusability tie in is on the metrics of engagement. Previously, uh, you could hardly see how many times somebody has reused this API in the company and based on that, uh, either you could draw up some specs. So this is all heading in that direction where we'll soon start making recommendations of frequently used assets. If somebody is developing, so uh, what you'll see in the Dreamforce demos is as you're building a flow, you'll start seeing a recommendation given to you of what are the most frequently used assets. Something like Einstein Prediction Builder will use that. Uh, it will start recommending the most frequently used data set. So we are heading in that direction. You'll see that coming in the release there. And uh, yeah, the last one was really around the, all the deployment models and I don't have to talk about it. You know all of this uh, very well. So what's happening in H2? This is the last part. Sorry, that's my last slide, I promise. So we're already past the September 7th. Uh, September 28th, there is a webinar talking about how do you leverage automation? And this is for a CIO, CTO kind of an audience. We're bringing in some customers into this webinar who are already using our automation package uh, and successfully deployed it. Uh, 
so do do sign up to attend it. You get the link for it when you get the slide. Uh, we are also presenting at the Gartner IT Symposium, which is I think a global event happening in multiple cities. Um, and we are also going to be on stage at AWS reInvent because if you today check on AWS Marketplace, uh, and I'm not sure if you have been told this before, we are in a a co-selling model with AWS. So AWS salespeople get calmed on NoSoft sales if they position NoSoft in their deal cycle. They can get a quota retirement. So basically, this is a strong relationship between NoSoft and AWS as an ecosystem because of our infrastructure, primarily Cloud Hub being hosted on AWS. So we'll be on stage at AWS because they're all, again, a big customer of ours and we are a big customers of theirs. And you also please look out for signing up for the webinar series that talks about what are we doing with respect to our roadmap in the next roadmap. Uh, and there's going to be a customer feedback session as well on December. So these are some of the must watch out for events that I thought I'll put in a machine. And with that, I think it's a wrap. The yes, very quick question yeah, before sure. you, please. Did I just miss it or was there nothing around Cloud Up 2.0? Oh. Because uh, I, mean, I feel like I've been living under a rock. Like all of a sudden, for, Cloud Up 2.0. For like, Cloud Up 2.0, we are doing separate, I must say, enablements of this. <coughs> so if you as a partner are very interested in Cloud Up 2.0, I think um, we are driving some workshops to actually talk about what is Cloud Up 2.0 or how different is it from 1.0. And I think I've not purposefully put on this because we are doing that as a separate series right. of things. Okay. Yeah. Happy to uh, sign Yeah, up. I would like to know because, as I said, I feel like. Because yes, a lot of customers. Maybe you want to reach out there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Most welcome. It definitely, externally, it definitely felt like it was the right now. Yeah. Sure. Uh, with that, yeah, that's it for the So yeah, we'll just have the last one. Yeah. Uh, we had the trivia quiz for which you'll be like needing uh, maybe your internet on. If you don't have, you'll be connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, yeah. So as actually a complete quiz. So if you can take out your phone and enter uh, that URL and then put in the pen, then you will be able to join the quiz. Oh, Wi-Fi, sorry. Wi-Fi password is binary. Binary is Okay. Binary is zero one. Yeah, this is the Wi-Fi password. Zero one, zero one. Yeah, you can get to the guest file. Yeah, so um, is, there will be three multiple choice questions. Um, the winner of the Kahoot, the top three winners, right, will yeah. get a Mulesoft training voucher. Um, so let us know if you guys are ready. Is everybody ready with the Wi Fi connection? Is yeah. anybody not ready yet to raise your hands? Is it capital B? Capital B. Capital B, yeah. E-I-M-A-R-Y-0101. Yeah, it's capital. Yeah. It's capital B. Yeah. Oh. Is it clear limit reached? Yeah. Is that clear limit reached? Oh, wait, but there's no one's doing it. Let's refresh this page. Yeah, 12 minutes. Yeah, it's clear limit reached. Yeah, yeah, it says player, 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 player. Okay. It's a problem, problem, problem. Okay. Okay. Nice. We can use a traditional method. Okay, let's use the uh, more primitive version. You need, you need to pay a new subscription. Yeah. Be more vehicles. So, <laughs> in, <laughs> definitely next time. <laughs> So this way, um, you will have to you have to raise your hand really quickly, um, and then get the right answer. So, okay, ready, guys. The first question. 
So which integration pattern is enabled by the old data protocol and Salesforce Connect? Okay. Yeah. We have like three of them. <laughs> or we can, we can spend the bill later. Okay. 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 Um, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Kevin, you want? <laughs> I, 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 I was first. I think it was first. I think it was first. Okay. What's that? Yeah. 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 Virtualization I was listening to Eduardo. Very. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's the correct answer. Um, the next one. Which of these things is not supported by all data protocol? I'm watching. Yeah? The third, uh, the fourth so, one? You need to raise your hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. C. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well done. Well done. Well done. Last one. Which oh. of this is not a part of new software? Oh, thank guys. That's a big thing for tension all night. Congratulations. So I'll send you guys an email maybe in a week's time and then you can get any training courses you want to. Congrats. Well done, guys. Thank you. And this, yeah, I just have a few things to add up. Like, if you have taken any photos or anything, just tag us on like Mules of Meetups and Mules of Community or LinkedIn, Twitter. And yeah, we'll be getting a feedback survey form as well. So do let us know like how it went, what you all want us to suggest, I mean, improve or what you want to do us next time. If you want to host us at your place maybe next time, we'd love to. And you can contact us as well for meetups if you want to become a meetup leader or participate in any community activities or to stream next meetup or anything like that. Yeah, do let us know. Uh, apart from this, I guess, yeah, that's it. It's all yours for all. Thank you so much yeah. for coming. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just one more thing. I don't know whether we told everybody, but if you need the toilets, they're that way. Yeah, I, think so. I think I'm telling people, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that way.